first of all, thank you for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, actually, I found out about uh, the opportunity that I can present a couple of days ago. So I decided that uh, I will talk about uh, mostly today my journey uh, about ketone research during the last 12 years, highlighting the main uh, research findings and the lessons uh, that I learned over these uh, 12 years. Uh, first, I need to mention that the uh, information here is not a medical advice. And uh, I also have to mention that I'm an inventor of several patents related to this research. And those patents are owned by the University of South Florida. And I have to disclose I'm a co-owner of Ketone Technologies and owner of Addicious Nutrition. So my story started uh, 12 years ago when I moved to the United States. Uh, after I was hired by the CEO of the, the BIRD, Alzheimer's Institute, at the University of South Florida. So I arrived with two suitcases with a neuroscience PhD and uh, hope that I can make a, a big impact, a good impact. The first time when I was exposed to uh, uh, ketones or ketone research was through a hyperbaric experiment when I met my uh, now husband, uh, Dominic D'Agostino. At that time, his research uh, was mainly focusing on scuba diving related uh, problems. And uh, we uh, connected through scuba diving. And uh, soon after, we started working together. At that time, his research was mainly focusing on central nervous system oxygen toxicity. Uh, which we could simulate in hyperbaric chambers using laboratory rodents, where we could increase the pressure, increase the oxygen concentration, and simulate uh, these CNX oxygen toxicity seizures without actually putting the rats underwater. And the goal here was uh, to predict and prevent these seizures to restore uh, the brain energy metabolism. So when do people get uh, CNS oxygen toxicity seizures? For example, when they are uh, special operation divers using rebreathers. Also, when people are getting hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, for example, for wound healing, uh, for diabetic wounds. And also, people are doing uh, space simulation missions underwater, and they need to do uh, decompressions. So if you think that these scenarios are very extreme and you won't need this information, uh, just bear with me. The goal here was to preserve the brain energy metabolism. So prior to 1967, it was thought that the brain can only utilize glucose as a fuel. So these uh, fine people in Harvard uh, did a study by starving people. And <laughs> back then, it was possible. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they found that after a few days of starvation, the brain actually started to use a ketone body called beta-hydroxybutyrate, or BHP, primarily, and not only uh, glucose as a fuel. They not only starved these subjects, but they also in administered insulin, a quite high dose uh, insulin. And uh, they induced severe hypoglycemia. And interestingly, they found that the ketones preserved the brain energy metabolism even during severe uh, hypoglycemia. Indeed, uh, the ketogenic diet is also used for epilepsy. Uh, in some cases, uh, sometimes uh, with dr drug refractory epilepsy, it can be very helpful, and uh, especially uh, for pedi pediatric patients. Uh, you can find more information about this at the Charlie Foundation website. And uh, just a, uh, a little overview. I know that many of you are uh, familiar with ketones, but maybe some of uh, the viewers are not. So just a short uh, overview. 
Uh, how can you get into ketosis? Uh, you can either do uh, fasting or starvation, uh, calorie restriction, or uh, use the ketogenic diet, which is a low-carb, high-fat diet. So your body will, use, uh, will produce ketones. But for some people, this is uh, difficult to sustain. They don't want to starve. They don't want to follow a restrictive diet. So for those of us, there is another option, uh, uh, exogenous ketone supplements and precursors. For example, ketogenic fats, such as medium chain triglycerides, ketone salts, which are uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate, BHB molecules, bind to electrolytes, and ketone esters. So these uh, ketone molecules, uh, we know three of them, and uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate is the most abundant. These molecules can then fuel uh, different tissues in the body, uh, including the muscle, and the heart, and the brain. And in the brain, it's not only a fuel, but it's also a serve as a signaling molecule. In patients uh, with Alzheimer's disease, uh, people uh, have decreased uh, glucose utilization in the brain. In some cases, uh, the ketones can restore the brain energy metabolism. So going back to these uh, hyperbaric uh, experiments, the first experiments uh, we used uh, two different kinds of uh, ketone supplements. Uh, butanediol and 1,3-butanediol acetoacetate diester, or I will just call ketone ester. And indeed, the ketone ester was very effective to delay the latency to seizures, uh, which was very promising. So uh, later, I repeated uh, some of these experiments on uh, more age-appropriate older rats uh, that age resembled more like um, a middle-aged human. And I also tried different combinations of uh, the ketone supplements. For example, ketone ester mixed with MCT, or ketone salt mixed with MCT, or ketone ester in a half dose. So interestingly, I found that in this age group of the rodents, the ketone ester MCT uh, combination was the most uh, beneficial. And not only the latency to seizure increased, but also the seizure severity decreased in these animals. The other interesting thing uh, that we found is that while in the first experiment, uh, the beneficial effects were only correlating with the acid acetate, uh, levels. In these experiments, the correlations uh, with the beneficial effects were with the acetoacetate and uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate as well. So how can ketones restore the brain energy metabolism? We now know that ketones improve uh, mitochondrial function. They uh, increase ATP production in the mitochondria when we compare it to glucose. And not only that, they also lower uh, ROS production. And the ketones can also serve as signaling molecules, influencing uh, the expression of different genes. So based on this idea that ketones can improve energy metabolism, I wanted to study how does it translate in, in animal research? How can we see the benefits, actually? So I started doing uh, motor function research on the laboratory rodents. I used an uh, accelerating rotor rod. Um, probably some of you are familiar with this uh, device. Basically, it's a spinning rod. Uh, you put the rats on, on it, and they run as long as they can because they have the instinct a fear of height, uh, which I can relate. And <laughs> so they are scared to jump off, so they start to, uh, they try to stay on the rod as long as possible. And we can measure their endurance and motor function. 
So we administer different kind of ketone supplements to different uh, strains of uh, rodents, different age groups, and different administration methods, chronic, subchronic, acute. And what we found is that some ketone supplement in certain scenarios did improve the motor function. For example, in this uh, scenario with a four months old spragdali rat, uh, ketone ester and ketone salt was the most beneficial. But it was interesting that in every scenario, uh, different ketone supplement was more uh, beneficial. There is a publication on this, so I encourage you to, to look into this if, if you are interested which scenario and which ketone supplement uh, is the best. So while doing these experiments, I also noticed uh, two other interesting things. The first one that while I was measuring the ketone and the glucose levels of these animals, I found that the the ketone level not only increased, but their glucose level decreased. And not only the exercising rats, but also the non-exercising rats had lower blood glucose in response to taking, um, taking uh, the, the ketone supplement, which, have which can have important implications for people who would like to lower their blood glucose level. The other interesting thing that I noticed uh, while doing these experiments, that some of the rats uh, that were getting uh, the high dose of the, the ketone supplements, certain ketone supplements, they just looked down and they didn't care, they didn't have the fear, and they jumped off the rod. <laughs> <laughs> so that instinct disappeared. So I had the question, that what happened with anxiety? So <laughs> I became curious, and I started testing anxiety on the next uh, batch of rats. So this is a, a generally accepted device to study anxiolytic drugs and similar things. It's called elevated plasmase, and it's basically an elevated uh, cross-shaped uh, device which has two open and two closed arms where the closed arms are surrounded by balls. So uh, when we put the rats in the middle, the, uh, one rat at a time, uh, if they are anxious, uh, they prefer to spend more time in the closed arms. So what we found is that, again, with certain ketone supplements, the, the rats spend less time in the closed arms. They spend, they did uh, walk less distance in the closed arms, and the latency to enter to the closed arms uh, was higher in response to taking the ketone supplements. So again, different ketone supplements worked in different strains and different administration methods, a uh, different way. So not all of them get the same exact result. But in general, we can say that the, the ketone supplements were uh, very efficient, decreasing uh, their anxiety. So after many more research experiments and publications, now we know that ke exogenous ketone supplements have the therapeutic uh, potential for different psychiatric disorders, not only anxiety, but for example, uh, bipolar disorder uh, and others, because there are multiple mechanisms that are working synergistically to uh, restore the brain energy metabolism, changes uh, brain signaling, and can reduce uh, uh, neuroinflammation. So the next experiment, uh, I was curious that, OK, we could in improve motor function in, in normal rats without pathology. But uh, what, what happens with uh, animals uh, with pathology? So the next animal model that I used was GLUT1 deficiency uh, syndrome mice. Uh, if you are familiar with the disease uh, in humans, 
basically the GLAD1 receptor is reduced in the brain, so people have um, motor impairments, and uh, the ketogenic diet is actually very efficient to restore motor function in these people. So I was wondering, we, uh, we should test what happens if we administer uh, ketone supplements to these uh, uh, rodents who uh, showed the uh, GLUT1 deficiency syndrome uh, and instead of using the ketogenic diet. So I started feeding the, the mice with uh, different ketone supplements for weeks and weeks. I measure their uh, blood uh, ketone and glucose every week. And uh, by the way, their, their motor function improved, but something more interesting came out of this study, and I want to go in that direction. So when uh, these animals, uh, uh, these animals got very uh, stressed when I was taking their blood, every week, so I figured that, oh, maybe I will just put them in the anesthetic chamber. So they fall asleep in a couple of seconds, I take their blood, and then they wake up in a couple of seconds, so it's just less stressful for everybody. So while I was doing this, uh, I noticed that the, the, uh, the mice uh, that were getting the ketone supplement, they just didn't want to go to sleep. I was just sitting there with my timer, and the control animals, they fell asleep in a couple of seconds, and uh, the ketone-treated animals, they're still like running around much later, and they didn't want to go to sleep. So I started wondering, <clears throat> and actually another study came out of this observation, uh, what happens with delaying uh, the latency to anesthetic induction? And it turns out that the animals that were uh, fed the ketogenic diet or the animals that were uh, getting uh, ketones or ketone salt, uh, the ketones uh, delayed the latency to anesthetic induction, which is, again, proof of neuroprotection. <clears throat> and it can uh, potentially provide uh, neuroprotection from other harmful gases too, which again uh, can be important for, for example, people uh, working around harmful gases uh, such as firefighters. Again, uh, more details in the publications. Uh, several other uh, publications came out of this study too. So if you are interested in more details, uh, I recommend to, to check it out. So during this time, uh, there were other uh, projects ongoing in the lab uh, relating to cancer. Why cancer? Uh, Otto Warburg described first that cancer is a metabolic disease. And uh, the best demonstration is uh, the PET scan that basically they are using uh, uh, to locate tumor. Uh, because the cancer cells are overconsuming glucose and overcompete uh, uh, normal cells. Um, a, a very good uh, book about this, uh, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease by Thomas Seifert. Again, if somebody wants to go into details, I recommend to read this. But also other studies show that um, high glucose level also leads to poor uh, outcome, poor uh, clinical prognosis, and basically a blood glucose is, is corrected, cor correlated to uh, tumor growth. So uh, we also know that uh, mitochondria is um, abnormal in uh, uh, cancer cells. So the next question for me was what happens to cancer cells in the presence of ketones? Specifically, what happens with cell surface transporters of the cancer cells? And why, why is it important? Basically, the GLUT1 uh, transporter serves to transport glucose into the cell, which is uh, what we saw. It's a major fuel for the cancer cells. And the MCT receptors are used to transport lactate out, which is, again, a fuel for cancer cells. So 
what I wanted to know is uh, what happens to these specific receptors in response to ketone administration. So uh, I studied different uh, cancer cell lines. So the first one is a lung uh, carcinoma cell line from a um, white Caucasian male. Uh, this, is the this is the control, these four images, and this is the, ooh, I get there. This is the treated uh, image. And the green labels the GLUT1 transporters in control. You see the density is much higher. And after uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate administration, the GLUT1 transporter density decreased. Also, in another cell culture model, uh, which is a, a, gli a glioblastoma, cell culture from a female, 44 uh, years old female uh, subject, uh, the MCT receptors decrease too in response to BHB, and also the GLUT1 receptors decrease. This is the control, very intense green, and this is the treated, less intense green, less uh, GLUT1 transporter was visible. This is a three-dimensional reconstruction of uh, a, a cancer cell of a, a, a lung uh, carcinoma. Again, on the left, this is the, the control. You see a lot of green, uh, which is the uh, MCT1 transporters. And here is the BHB treated uh, with much less green, which is a much less uh, GLUT1 transporter. These are the cross sections of the of the cells, and also uh, just a quick uh, video. It's like slicing the cell, like slicing the bread. You can see inside and outside. There's a lot of green, a lot of transporters in the control cells, and uh, in the treated cells, there's much less inside and outside of the cells. So the other interesting thing that I observed while doing the animal studies, the cell studies, and we soon started um, human studies too, I noticed that not all the results added up. Something was just not right. And um, I started to look at the data, what's going on. and. Um, I noticed that there was some kind of concentration dependent effect, uh, but not in a way what you would expect. So next we looked at uh, the glucose transporter expression in response to BHB in cell cultures. We looked at uh, in animal model, uh, the anxiolytic effect in response to ketone acer MCT. And also uh, we looked at the uh, insulin level in humans in response to ketone supplementation, uh, ketone salt and ketone ester. And what we found is that at certain level, this is another cancer cell line, uh, glioblastoma uh, cancer cell line. Interestingly, when it was a low concentration of beta-hydroxybutyrate, the GLUT1 transporter con uh, density decreased here. But when we further increased the concentration, the, the concentration, uh, uh, the density of the GLUT1 transporter increased again. So we found that there must be some kind of compensatory mechanism when the ketone level was too high. Similarly, in the animal study, uh, researching anxiety uh, in another, using another model, which is a light, dark uh, box test, which uh, basically, if the animal spends more time in the light area, it's uh, less anxious. And if uh, the latency to entry to the dark is um, higher than it's less anxious. So basically we found again that the low concentration of ketone ester MCT decreased anxiety, but higher concentration didn't work. 
similar uh, surprising uh, results when a uh, human consumed high dose of BHB ketone salt or a high dose of ketone ester, we found that in the case of ketone ester, the insulin level increased, which was not the case with ketone salts. These results kind of uh, opened the question that maybe more is not always better. So we hear it very often that people are focusing on higher and higher uh, ketone levels to achieve that, but some results are showing that it might be not the best option, at least not for every application. And this is uh, probably the most exciting uh, research for me, uh, a research project that you probably see already on my poster. If not, then I will quickly explain. So basically, I, uh, I got primary neurons, uh, which you can already buy in the, in the store, basically. <laughs> and you play. <laughs> You plate them in, uh, in petri dishes, and you grow them. And uh, I scratch them to simulate a brain injury and monitor them over 24 hours, uh, what happened to, to the damaged area, by taking uh, photos uh, with a microscope every 15 minutes. And then uh, I created a, a time-lapse video. So what I found is that in the control petri dish, after 24 hours, in the damaged area, there was basically no cell. The damage remained about the same. Nothing changed. But after 24 hours, in the BHB-treated petri dishes, the cells migrated into the damaged area. Uh, and not only migrated into the damaged area, but when we labeled a synapsin that shows uh, new synapses, for example, here uh, with red, so these, these four is the control dish. So basically here you can see barely any red or synapse, new synapses, but in the BHB-treated uh, Petri dish, there was a lot of uh, new synapses forming around the damaged area. Also, we uh, used... Uh, a tubulin to label a microtubulus, which is uh, green here. So in the control, you see that, well, the cells have uh, like microtubulus. But in the BHB-treated cultures, the microtubulus density was higher. Uh, and also, uh, we found them in the damaged area, showing that the neurons actually started uh, growing processes into the damaged area. And this is actually shows the same. It's just a higher resolution image. This is uh, the control. Basically, no red, no new synapses. A little bit more, uh, a little bit of the, the tubulin. But in the treated, more red, new synapses, and more uh, microtubulus uh, was observed. And this is a, a video of the time lapse. Uh, uh, over the 24 hours of the control slide. So basically, you, you see that nothing really happened. Uh, the damage is still there. And the next video, you will see the BHB treated uh, Petri dish. You can see that the cells are moving like crazy inside the damaged area, growing processes and that some areas, they are even almost closing the damage. So these results can have very important implications for people uh, with brain injuries, for example, with a traumatic brain injury, or people who play sports or have a job then when they are exposed to uh, concussions. So uh, after these experiments, Two things happened. One, uh, I married my husband, and I, I got fired <laughs> because we were not allowed to work together anymore. So I'm still trying to continue this research project. <laughs> well, after that, I 
I started working with NASA and astronauts and DARPA, so it's all fine, but still these, these studies need to be finished by somebody. The other thing that happened is that during all these years, I've seen enough about the potential of this molecule, and especially this experiment convinced me that, oh, maybe I should be consuming these molecules. <laughs> So I knew that at, this, uh, at that time, there was no commercially available ketone supplement that was uh, optimally formulated that we would like to consume. So I decided to uh, create my own company, uh, Audacious Nutrition. And uh, USF actually enrolled me into uh, a program that was established by the government to help scientists and academics to uh, bring their invention into the market so people can actually benefit from it. Uh, so over a couple of years, um, uh, I developed the product, and you can get some outside <laughs> if, you, if you feel like it, trying it. Uh, and during the last year, since it was in the, on the market, I got a lot of good feedback from people with epilepsy, with migraine, with bipolar disorder, that it really helped them, that, that others uh, didn't. So I feel that uh, I could make uh, a positive impact uh, with this. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, the company or the products, just find me after. And basically, the lessons learned during these uh, times Based on the, the research that I did, and also many hundreds of other researchers and hundreds of other uh, research publications, now we know that ketones can increase ATP energy production, can improve motor function, can improve uh, mitochondrial function, influence gene expression, lower ROS production, reduce neuroinflammation, can improve cognitive function, lower blood glucose, and can help with neuroprotection and neuroregeneration. The other lessons that I learned is that different ketones were good for different applications. So this is a research area that uh, will need more attention because it's not general. and. Uh, we have to uh, direct more research in that direction. The other uh, lesson that we learned is that more is not always better, as I mentioned before. And also, it was a very important lesson for me to keep an open mind when I'm looking at the experiment, what's happening, not just trying to prove something that I want to prove, but actually observing what's happening with the cells, what's happening with the animals, because maybe the new directions can lead to even more interesting results. The other lesson I learned is to have a backup plan when you marry your coworker. <laughs> <laughs> but if the, anything negative happens, just try to focus on the opportunities and not on the limitations, because uh, I think in this way my, you might get better results and can make a bigger impact than you originally planned. And with that, I would like to thank uh, many people who participated in these, uh, in these research projects. My husband, primarily, Dominic D'Agostino, uh, many of his students, many of my students, are collaborators in Hungary, uh, Zsolt Kovács, and some of the companies who provided uh, partial funding uh, for accomplishing these uh, projects, such as Quest Nutrition, Ketone uh, Technologies, Office of Navy Research, and the USF uh, Foundation. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. So the observation about delayed onset of anesthesia effect with isoflurane is fascinating because in the cardiovascular literature with heart surgery, isoflurane is known to produce 
pre-ischemic conditioning, meaning if you expose someone before heart surgery to isoflurane compared to other anesthetics, the heart tolerates ischemia from being on pump or at to total cardiac arrest. So can you relate that to the delayed onset with ketones? Yes, yeah, so that, that's very interesting. So actually, we, we started talking to anesthesiologists. What do they think about all this, and what is the application for their field, too? So we started doing additional experiments on, on this subject, and it's right now ongoing, um, mainly in Hungary, to address some of these details. So I can't really answer the question, but we are on, on it to, to find out more details. How, how is this actually working? Because like everybody was surprised. And, but this can be very important if people in ketosis are being put under anesthesia or, or different applications. Thank you. Hi, doctor. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question is, um, these appear to be mostly uh, in vitro studies. So um, I'm kind of wondering about the applicability to, uh, you know, obviously in humans, which is in vivo. Um, are the ketone concentrations you're using uh, similar to uh, someone who is uh, reasonably well keto adapted, you know, the same, same concentration as in the blood? Of, of someone, like what concentrations are we, are we talking about here? Yeah, so we completely agree that all these needs to be moved to, to human research, so that's the next step, and some of the projects started, there are some clinical trials uh, addressing these, these questions. Uh, actually, they are starting a clinical trial in a hospital in Norway using uh, BHB uh, for TBI patients. Uh, what is the, the ideal concentration and how does it relate to the cell culture studies? Again, it's a very, very difficult question to just give a generalized answer because every application, what, I, I, what we can see that every application is different and every ketone supplement is different and every person's metabolism is different. Like somebody who is following the ketogenic diet for years will probably respond differently than somebody who's completely new to the idea. So again, this is like a very complex and complex question, and I, I wouldn't feel comfortable just give a, a single word answer. <laughs> right. Understood, thank you. Great talk, thank you. Um, my understanding is that for ketones to be utilized in the citric acid cycle, you need succinyl CoA. And so when I saw your GLUT1 increase with higher uh, ketone concentrations, my gut instinct is that the glucose would be needed to generate oxaloacetate to serve as a source of new succinyl CoA to deal with higher ketone concentrations, and that you would be able to achieve optimal cellular utilization of the ketones if you had glucose or if you supplemented with oxaloacetate or glutamate or alpha-ketoglutarate or citrate or anything that's upstream from succinyl-CoA. I was wondering what you think about that because it, it seems like if, if that is the mechanism that there would be ways you could hack around that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good idea and, and probably it would be a more ideal uh, combination uh, that, again, we, we probably need to test, uh, because this was just a one, uh, a couple of studies, but we can probably optimize this further, like with, with compounds you mentioned and, and ideas like that. Yes, thank you. Um, my question to just a little more basic, thank you, it's really interesting research, and I've followed some of the research over the years, but the question I had is, the rats that were given the supplemental ketone salts, were they in a ketogenic state? It's kind of along the lines of what we heard earlier. Were they already in a ketogenic state in terms of how you prep them, or was this ketones given within a regular glucose metabolism state? So trying to correlate that to a human population that's largely not ketogenic, so that's one question. And then my second question has to do with long COVID research. Um, COVID also apparently metabolizes glucose, and I'm so just like cancer, and I'm wondering if you've turned any attention towards that using ketogenic supplements. 
Yeah, so uh, going backwards, uh, I didn't do any COVID-related research, and I'm not comfortable addressing any yeah. of that idea because I just I just don't know. I didn't yeah. do any any of that uh, research. And um, the first question, what was? It? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the first question about the rats um, coming into the oh, study yeah, that yeah, were given yeah. the ketone the ketone salts. Yeah, so were they ketogenic to begin with, or were they just on a mixed diet? Yeah. So when when I mentioned the treatment group as ketone ester or ketone salt or whatever ketone supplement, they were on standard diet. Okay. So when I mentioned that ketogenic diet, that that group was on ketogenic diet, but the others were on standard, standard diet, just shelf. taking the, the supplements. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your talk here and the questions. Uh, there's a primal play session starting right now, out meeting out in the lobby, uh, and in 20 minutes the next talk starts. But uh, Sheila, would you be sticking around for some last minute questions, maybe? Yeah, sure. Okay. Or like one, one, two more questions. Yeah, mine's quite been a lot. <laughs> okay, really, really fascinating. And so, uh, similar to what Ben was saying, this is all in vitro. Do we have any studies out there yet that are showing, even if they're observational only, some sort of effect on humans? Like, how do we know? Like, you've got a supplement comp company, which is great, yeah. but <laughs> do we have any kind of evidence that it actually translates into humans yet? Yeah, there are many studies on, on humans, too. I didn't specifically uh, do that, but there are many studies in the literature. You can find them on our website that we reference them, or you can just do a, a Google research. So yes, during the last couple of years, more and more uh, research started to focus on specific supplements or just in general inducing ketosis with either the diet or with the supplements. But there are studies out with, with humans. OK, excellent. And so we are, we are seeing some effect on humans on, let's say, anxiety. Yes, so not, not all the applications that I mentioned here, but some applications, yes. OK, great, thanks. Excellent talk and uh, really impressive series of experiments that uh, you presented. Um, I'm curious with a lot of the rat experiments or the rodent experiments as well as with the tissue, was that extracted from male rats or were you controlling for sex differences and looking uh, in female rats as well? And if not, were you, would you expect that there would be differences in some of the findings you observed? Yes, that's a very good question. Thank you. So uh, these experiments that I presented here, these were all male rats. But we started also uh, some experiments that are gender specific. So we actually have a, a paper that I didn't mention here looking at ketone and glucose level uh, in female and male rats. And it's different. And also. Uh, different applications, for example, anxiety. We are we have we are having uh, experiments right now in Hungary, running uh, some studies on on anxiety, and the female and the male rats uh, respond differently. So stay tuned; it will be published really soon. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank again Dr. Adi D'Agostino for sharing her work with us. Thank you. And let's please meet back here.